Are we visible? Trip, I'm going to ask you to uh, stop sharing and reshare your screen. Okay, do you see my presentation now? No. How about now? Reload here. No, it's giving us the window inside of a window. <clears throat> okay. So let's, if you can, can you, Yep, you're going to share your screen and then pick your presentation. How about this? There we go. Yay, here we go. Well, I think I have a live audience now. So let me talk for a little bit about helicopter duration. So this is a presentation about an event that we call helicopter duration that is called in international competition gyrocopter duration. What's the difference between the two? Well, an auto gyro uses an unpowered rotor in free auto rotation, moved by the movement of the of the air vehicle through the air, but not by power. The helicopter uses a powered rotor. These are gyrocopters. These are not, in fact, helicopters. So I'll still call them helicopters, but still technically they are in fact gyrocopters. So let me talk a little bit about the rules associated with competition and the NAR competition and international or FAI competition concerning the event that we'll call helicopter colloquially. Uh, the objective of the competition is to return a rocket through the air that is providing lift by rotation of blades. And the rotation has to be about the vertical axis of the model, and that's true in, in both NAR and FAI. Uh, in NAR, we're tolerant of models that flip over or turn and fly upside down. FAI rules require that the system work correctly. Uh, it's self-penalizing if you flip upside down, but in the FAI rules, that would be a, what they call a start to zero DQ. The recovery system has to be actually blades. It can't be um, like a windmill with little stringers that have um, flexible material between them. And a big difference between gyrocopter or helicopter in internationals and in the U.S. is that in FAI flying, the blades come out of a body. The body has to be at least 500 millimeters long from nose tip to the bottom of the body tube. And it has to be at least 40 millimeters in diameter for at least half of its length. This is the same body shape requirement as parachute or streamer duration. You've heard those presentations before. What this means is that your blades are internal and they spring out of the rocket at ejection. In the U.S., that is not necessarily required. You can do it, but you don't have to do it. In FAI, you have to do it. So here's a couple of different design approaches. The external blade approach has been the common one used in the NAR competition for many years. The blades are attached to the, um, typically somewhere up in the nose of the rocket. They fold down along the length of the body. The body is engine, body, engine diameter, 13 millimeter, 18 millimeter, whatever and the blades tuck down between the fins during boost. A burn string is burned at ejection and um, the blades then spring open. It's kind of draggy for boost, but it's pretty simple. It does have to be pretty tail heavy in order to come down right side up. The internal blade system, which has to be used in FAI, you fold the blades as before, but they fold and then go down inside a body that's larger, considerably larger than the engine in diameter. And the piston, um, it ejects the, there's a piston system in it that um, causes the blades to come out. The blades are attached to a hub, the blade spring to the open position, and this, the blade hub system spins around and it's attached to the booster body by a long Kevlar cord and the body descends hanging underneath the rotating uh, blade hub. The body has to be really light for this to work. These are harder to build. They can be heavier than the NAR models. They are physically larger than most NAR models, at least up through the A power class. But you do get a high boost altitude because your, your drag on boost is pretty low. 
and it's sort of a trade. I fly, in fact, FAI models, FAI style models. I fly an NAR competition in the A and higher power classes. They're really not that competitive in half A. They're just there's too much, too much uh, mass to them. But in uh, in A and above, they're competitive, and in B and above, they're, in my opinion, superior. You can use you do use folding blades in either approach, um, but there's another way. The blades can fold more than once. And so the folding can be just the blade springs out. That's, of course, required. But the blade can then also unfold and become wider or unfold along its length and become longer. Either way, you have a bigger blade than the folded size. Um, that's not very competitive, but it, it is fairly widely used. Here's a couple of very simplistic pictures of the external blade designs. And when I'm done with the presentation, I will um, go out of screen share and I will hold up a couple of models as examples. And as we go through this, if you have questions, I can read the Q&A, but I, I would prefer to just blow through the presentation. And then I'll go to Q&A and I'll come out of the PowerPoint and we'll have a conversation and I'll hold up a few things as examples. So these are two examples of NAR style gyrocopters. We call them helicopters. On the left, the rotor rock, which has the blades attached to the body fixed. On the right, the Rosa rock, which is um, blades are attached to a hub that's attached to the body by a, a shaft, but the hub is free, free spinning. So the body, the, the fins on the bottom do not rotate while the blades rotate. In a rotor rock, the fins rotate at the same time the blades do. Uh, those are two different design approaches. They're both competitive NAR designs. We've seen these around our, our own flying fields for years. This is an FAI model descending. This is a pretty snazzy looking model. It has blades that have unfolded after deployment, not once, but twice to become longer. And it has some kind of little cute angle on it. This is a non-competitive design. It's too heavy. Uh, the blades are too long. The rotational moment of inertia of the blade system is such that the, um, the rate of rotation of the blades is slow, fairly slow. And it turns out that's not advantageous, but this looks really cool. And you can see how the whole thing is put together. There's a nose cone hanging under the bottom. There's that whale of a body tube that's made out of super thin fiberglass, so it's actually not very heavy. You can see the shaft that connects that to the hub. The hub is up at the center of the three blades, and the hub rotates around that little carbon shaft. Very pretty design. Not a winning design, but a very pretty design. So how do they work? Well, you have multiple blades, three, four, five, six. The, the right answer is three. There have been some R&D projects done where people looked at more, but more is more mass. And if the blades are spinning really fast, three is sufficient. So they, they are symmetrical around the, uh, the roll axis of the shaft, that, that either, which is either the model's body itself or that carbon shaft that you saw in the previous picture. They deployed Apogee. And then as the model falls through the air, the airspeed from the model's descent creates airflow over the blades, which induces lift, which then makes the blades spin. The component of blade lift that's perpendicular to the long axis of the model, think that carbon shaft, that causes the blades to start rotating. And that component of blade lift is provided by the part of the blade closest to the hub. And so you have a different angle of attack. The blades, the blades are typically twisted or curved so that the angle of attack close to the hub is higher, and the angle of attack out at the tip is lower. And that inner part of the blade is what drives the blade into rotation. The outer part of the blade is what creates the lift that produces performance. So the descent rate is proportional to the mass of the rocket divided by the rotor disc area, that is the circle that's circumscribed by those blades rotating around. You want to have minimum mass, and maximum rotor disc area, but you also need that rotor disc to be, the blades to be spinning so fast that that set of blades behaves truly as almost equivalent aerodynamically to a parachute. If the blades are, are swinging, spinning slowly around, you have three small airfoils spinning around producing lift. If they're spinning around at, uh, at a rate that you, can, you can't even see them, they're moving so fast, they're creating essentially a disc. It's about 85% of the drag coefficient of a spherical parachute if they're spinning really fast. And the reason that the very long uh, blades don't work all that well is that they have a, a pretty high rotational moment of inertia and they resist 
it's the inertia against the aerodynamic force that would cause them to spin. So they don't tend to spin very fast. And that's why the, the longer blades turn out uh, over history, over experience have turned out to not be advantageous. The descent rate can never be zero. Uh, it can be zero with respect to the ground, but they have to be falling through the air to, in order to produce lift to, to stay in the air. So you can't have a zero descent rate, but the goal is to put it in a thermal so that the air is going up and the model is falling down through the air and its speed relative to the ground is as close to zero as possible, or it might even be negative. It might actually be rising if you put it in a strong updraft. But if it actually stopped falling at all relative to the wind, relative to the air mass, the blades would stop rotating. So blade twist. So if you look at the picture on the right, the, uh, the part of the blade that is um, closest to the hub, which is the top part, is operating at a pretty high angle of attack. And it's, dry, it's producing the, the force that causes the blade to start rotating. So if you have a problem with your helicopter, not rotating, not coming up to speed right away. You don't have enough angle of attack at the center, close to the hub. You don't want a lot of angle of attack out at the tip, which is where the lift is being produced. Because if you do, when they spin really fast, they're gonna stall. If you've seen a helicopter spin up to speed and then stop, and then start spinning up to speed again and then stopping, that's because your angle of attack out at the tip of the blades is too high. There's too much twist in the blades. If you're looking down the axis of the rocket, visualize looking down that carbon uh, spar that the, the blades are rotating around. You want almost zero angle of attack out at the tip of the blade, so it is perpendicular to that spar, and you want a significant angle of attack, 20, 20 degrees or so, maybe 30 degrees in at the hub, and it will um, that will cause it to get up to speed. The part in close to the hub causes it to start rotating, and once it starts rotating, the blade produces lift, and it's the outer part of the blade that's producing the lift. So you typically have either a twist between the hub and the tip, or a curved blade that's wider at its root than it is at its tip. And that's the designs I'll show you. That's the equivalent of having twist in the blade. You want the ma maximum rotation rate you can possibly get. You want the blades to be a blur. You do not want to even be able to distinguish the separate blades. If you get that kind of rotation speed, uh, as I said before, this model is going to behave almost like a parachute, a, a balsa parachute. Uh, you get significant amounts of uh, lift out of that blade system. And if it's rotating slowly, you'll get considerably less. In order to get fast rotation out of that blade system, you need blades that are low drag, keep them really thin. I, I use 132nd inch balsa wood, if you can believe that, for my A and half A helicopter when I'm putting them in inside the body. If you put 132nd inch balsa wood as an external blade, it would shred on boost. But as an internal blade, it seems very fragile, but it in fact is strong enough to take the kind of rotation speed that you want. So it's very thin, it's very smooth. Um, if you're using a US helicopter design, where you have the helicopter blades attached to the body. The reason the Rosa Rock is superior to the Rotor Rock is that in the Rosa Rock, the hub is rotating freely independently of the body. In the Rotor Rock, the blades are attached to the body and the fins are attached to the body. So as the blades rotate, the body rotates, the fins rotate, and the fins have considerable drag and resistance against rotation. So it slows down the rotation rate. So you don't want to slow down the rotation rate. Uh, I mentioned earlier that rotational moment of inertia is important. So long blades, thick blades, heavy blades come up to speed slowly, and they don't reach the same speed that a, a smaller blade, a thinner blade, a lighter blade would achieve. Now, obviously, the blade has to be have some length to it or it can't produce enough lift. So there's a trade-off in there. Most of the blades for international helicopter models are on the order of 12, 13 inches long because that's what fits inside a, uh, a body that's overall um, 500 millimeters long. I know th that many of you have seen helicopter models flip over. Uh, two things can cause that. One is that uh, you don't have a dihedral angle in your blades. But that is an angle, upward angle uh, relative to the, uh, the rotation plane. And you have to keep the descent center of gravity low. So the international models, you're hanging the body underneath the blade system. 
if that body is so light that it falls in parallel, uh, coming down side by side with the blade system, then you actually aren't going to get good rotation. You get decued, in fact. So, um, so it's important to have the body dangle underneath the, the uh, international glider or international helicopter model. And sometimes in US designs, you end up having to um, leave the engine hanging out the back of the model to get the center of gravity of the model down low enough that it stays, it comes down in the correct orientation. In fact, uh, I'll show you a model later on that's the one I've been using for half a. I have to leave all but a half an inch of the motor casing sticking out the back and hold it in with tape in order for the thing to not flip upside down. But when it comes down in the correct orientation, it performs awesomely. If I move the motor too far up, uh, it flips over, it comes down upside down, and it does not perform awesomely. I mentioned earlier that if you have blade rotation that stops and then restarts and then stops and then restarts, you have too much pitch angle in your blades, particularly out at the tip, so you need to change the angle. So this is a picture of uh, one of the two models that I used at the World Championships in 2014 to get a bronze medal. Um, I got it back, got this one back. I didn't get the other one back. The other one is still in Bulgaria somewhere. They managed to put it off into the distance and dark was falling and we never found it. But I'll show you this model, I still have it. But you can see in here, it's a 40 millimeter diameter body that's um, with the nose coming on, it would be 500 millimeters long. It has three blades. The blades are about 13 inches long. I'll show you more of the details of what it looked like and with a couple pictures, and then I'll come out of screen share and I'll hold it up physically. I still have it. This is a picture of, of the hub system. You can see that the blades are curved, and I'll, I'll talk about how you do that in a few minutes. But that is the equivalent of putting a twist in the blade. If you have a blade that is curved and you have a thicker part of the blade at the center than at the tip, that's equivalent to having an angle of attack um, at this at the at the hub that's greater than the angle of attack at the tip so it causes the blade to spin up and produce great lift you do that and I'll, I'll show you how we do that here in a few minutes here's an underside picture of the hub assembly it's three dubro uh, model airplane hinges sandwiched between two hexagons of balsa wood or 164th plywood and you have little arms on those hinges that go out and glue to the blades. And the whole system rotates on a very thin carbon shaft. This is carbon tubing, aerospace composite products. And that's the system. It's a little tricky to make. I'll show you another picture though of the Apogee kit. This is the rotary revolution kit that Apogee makes. Different hub design, very clever. Um, this is a nice kit. I have one of those, I'll show it to you. If you're trying to get into international helicopter duration, gyrocopter duration, we call it S9. This is a great kit to use. It has this hub system is first rate. Uh, the blades design, curve, right, right shape, everything's just right. The body that hangs under it is way too heavy. Uh, but you, if you listen to Steve Crystal's presentation on how to build paper bodies, you know how to make a body that's considerably lighter than the one that Apogee makes for their kit. But you can't really do much better than the hub system that Apogee sells. These are all laser cut, uh, one thirty second plywood parts. Very nice design. And it's uh, a little easier to make than my design. But, um, and, you know, my design's slightly lighter, slightly better. But this is a completely competitive rotor system. Speaking of my design, um, Keith Vineyard was the founder, the inventor of the overall design that I used. I made a few little improvements. I learned from Keith, uh, and I finally talked Keith into writing an article for Sport Rocketry documenting his design. And Doug Hilson did drawings. I gave Doug one of my models, which is basically the same design that Keith uses. And Doug did some spectacular CAD drawings that are in the January, February 2020 Sport Rocketry magazine issue that show all of the details of how you make one of these uh, S9 models. You can see here's the blade. It's 132nd inch balsa, 13 and a half inches long. You can see an exploded view of the hub system up on the right uh, with all the dimensions and, and all the pictures that you need to build one of these. And then here's a picture of the hub system uh, in flight mode. You can see the long, thin carbon shaft, 0.06 carbon. You can actually use 0.04. That's currently what I'm using. 
um, and you use a little fine aluminum tubing that you can get at hobby stores if you still have a hobby store that slip fits over that tubing and you glue that up the center of the hub you glue the um, the long carbon rod into a foam plug that goes up inside the nose cone exactly the apogee system so this is a really well documented design if you want to pursue this path if you want to pursue the apogee path then you can buy the kit uh, i would recommend putting a lighter body on it once you learn how to fly it I, you can just take the whole hub system and blade system off and make one of steve crystal's paper bodies and put it on there this is very similar to all of the fai duration events lightness is victory your model has to be light uh, you need to minimize the weight wherever you can every place you can you're in a craftsmanship battle with some exquisite craftsmen in from east largely from eastern europe they know how to make things really light if you want to be competitive in world championships competition you have to learn how to build light uh, you've had a couple presentations on how to do that whether you're using paper tubes or fiberglass tubes but the tube needs to be light and the uh, in this particular case the blade hub system needs to be light you need to maintain um, close attention to drag. You need to minimize the boost drag. And certainly, you don't want anything that resists the rotation of the, uh, of the model, which applies to US designs, because in international designs, obviously, you have a, a spinning hub system. But US designs with the blades attached to the body um, are going to have some significant uh, drag that opposes their rotation. So you need to think of ways like the Rosa Rock to minimize the resistance of the fins to the desire of the rocket to rotate. You got to get the pitch angles right on the blades. Uh, you have a twist in them. You have more camber at the root, zero at the tip. And if you do anything different from that, they either won't spin up because you didn't have enough camber at the root, or they'll spin up and then stop if you had too much camber at the tip. Uh, it's good to make the blades long and thin. They don't need to be real thick. You put dihedral in their attachment to the hub. And you got to use strong elastic to open them. You want to open them before ap slightly before apogee. If these things turn over, go over the top in apogee, and then eject pointed down, there is no great guarantee that they're going to actually stay in the right orientation when they come down. So you want to, to not do that. But strong elastic is the key. And rem remembering to attach the elastic. These have little rubber bands on them that uh, you have to set right before you pack it up to fly. If you forget to set them, I've done that a few times, they don't open, surprise, surprise. So you need strong elastic because you have some resistance of the airflow over the model to the blades wanting to open. And if you have strong elastic, it'll power through that resistance. If you have just one rubber band or a weak rubber band, there might be enough airflow over the model that the blades will never open. So that was the PowerPoint slides. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And hopefully you'll be able to see me. And I will hold up a couple of models and show you what I'm talking about here. First, I will hold up this model. This is basically a rotor rock design with small blades. This is a half A helicopter model. The blades are attached to the body. and they're held open by rubber bands that attach to little hooks up here on the nose and to a hook here on the blade. You can see I put a little flap back at the back of the uh, rotor blade to cause the, the rotor blade to have enough uh, ang effective angle of attack back there to get spun up. And this model performs spectacularly in, in half A and A um, helicopter duration. I have one narrow with this. And it's the same model. Um, it has not flown away yet. So that's a typical U.S. design. It's small. Uh, this would be a typical Internet's design. This is bigger. This is, in fact, the model that I flew in Bulgaria. You can see the little sticker there, the registration sticker from the World Championships. And in this case, you pull the blades. The blades are mounted to a, a hub that's glued up here in the nose cone. The ejection charge blows this out, and the blades spring open like this. I don't have it currently connected with the string to the to the body, but you can see the, the fine carbon shaft here with a little loop at the bottom where the uh, 
loop would be attached to a line that's connected inside the body of the rocket so that the whole thing dangles down like this. So this is the design that you see in the Keith Vineyard article. You can see the underside, the three uh, plastic hinges, the, the hexagonal hub, the carbon shaft. And you can see that the blades are curved. Now, they're curved because I formed them over a uh, mandrel. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. In exactly the same way that Tim Van Milligan describes how to do it for his model. This is the Van Milligan model. This is the Rotary Revolution from Apogee. Nice design, nice hub system. I'll pull it out. The blades will spring open. You can see there's the hub system that you saw the close-up picture of. Here is the uh, carbon shaft with the Kevlar line connecting it to the body. And the body is a lightweight but um, regular body tube with a paper to taper, a conical taper. The, the body tube is too heavy. This, this model weighs, the body, the bottom part of this model weighs 15 and a half grams. And, and my model that I flew at the World Championships, it was six. The hub systems are close to the same weight. So this is a very competitive hub system, but the body is too heavy. But it's a great way to learn. If you build one of these, you, you really will understand how to build an Internet's S9 model. Fly it a couple times, get the kinks out, and then replace the body on the bottom with a lighter one, and you have a competitive model. And I mentioned briefly that you would form your blades around a mandrel. So this is a blade that's been formed on a mandrel. This is my uh, mandrel that I use to make the fiberglass bodies for Internet models. I soaked the, uh, I rubbed the, the blade, balsa blade, having sanded it smooth, surface smooth. I rubbed it, soaked it with ammonia. And then I taped it to the mandrel here, and I will take the ace wrap off. But then after you tape it to the mandrel, at the top and the bottom, you very tightly wrap an ace wrap around the whole thing. And you let it sit for a day. And when the ammonia evaporates and the blade dries out, and then you have a permanent curl in your blade, and I'll show you what that looks like. So here's the blade taped to the mandrel. And when you take the tape off, uh, you lift the blade off, you have a curved blade. And it's a curved angle that is almost exactly right. It's the same. I, I formed the blades that I did well at the internets with. Uh, I formed them around the same mantle that I used to make the body tube. Turned out that must have been the optimum um, curve because I, I um, got a medal with it. Okay, let me look at a few of the questions over on the right. Uh, if you have a model that's designed to descend nose first, that would still be proper. Yeah, if you if you do all your aerodynamics for the blades the other way, uh, you can design a model that would fall nose first. But if you've designed your blade aerodynamics to fall tail first and it falls nose first, it's not going to work real well. But you actually could go either way. It's kind of hard to have the body hanging under the rocket um, in the international style and descending nose first. Blade tips from ejection. Yeah, so Steve Crystal asked, do I do anything to protect the blade tips from ejection charges? Yes. I, in fact, I rub a thin coat of epoxy on the bottom inch and a half of the blades on both sides. Otherwise, at the time of ejection, they will catch on fire and the blade will become progressively shorter <laughs> as your flight goes along. Not good. So yeah, I, I rub that thin coat of epoxy on them. Thanks for reminding me about that, Steve. Do I use an internal shock line or a Herbie style external line? I use an internal line because I don't want any danger of tangling. And I also don't, I want the body to hang directly underneath the model. Um, I don't want the body sailing off horizontally. You want the body to fall, the, these fiberglass light bodies, you want them to fall horizontally for streamer duration for sure, maybe for parachute duration, uh, because the lift of the body uh, adds to the lift of the recovery device and improves overall performance. If you have lift on the body in a helicopter model or gyrocopter model, uh, it might start floating up to where the blades are. It would not be hanging underneath the blades, uh, and that's not good. So I prefer personally using the internal approach, and 
have less chance of getting the line tangled with the blades when they're trying to deploy and a greater chance that the body will dang vertically, dangle vertically underneath the uh, rotating blades. Does it matter how far you allow the body to dangle below the carbon fiber rod or rotors? Well, not really, but um, you need to put a meter or so of line on there just to absorb the shock, or you need to put some elastic in, in series in the line to absorb some of the shock because there is a significant pop when the ejection charge goes off. And um, if you have a short line on there when the blades, when the hub and blades reach the full extent of the line, it's going to be a snap and it might, something, something's going to break. Now, you don't want that. So you use a fairly long line just as your shock absorber. Or you use a piece of elastic. I actually use a little uh, six inch piece of elastic in series with a shorter line. Other people use just a longer line. Either way, you need some way for the, uh, the two parts to have some form of shock absorbing in between them. Yeah, so the blades, yeah, so you're rotating at really, really high speed. Um, so if your blades aren't all the same, if they aren't all straight, if they are different in any degree in weight uh, or drag, uh, you're going to get a wobble. Uh, it's not good. So you really do need to have three blades that are identical. In fact, when I'm making these blades, I make quite a lot of them, and I weigh them. I weigh every blade, and I pick three blades. I pick the lightest ones, of course, but then I pick three blades that each weigh the same and put them on my hub. I don't want blades that are different in weight because then you'll get an uneven rotation uh, of the hub. Uh, let's see what else have I got for questions. What balsa weight am I using? Uh, when I'm using 132nd, I'm using about six pound. If you're going to go to to 16th, which the Apogee kit does, then I would use a little less than six pound if you can find it. Good luck with that these days. I have a, I've been in the hobby a really long time. I have a lot of balsa. I have a lot of really good balsa. So I have some light stuff, but it's really hard to find light stuff these days. When I order it from SIG and pay for the, the, the premium for contest grade, four to six pound, and if I get eight pound, I'm lucky. So light balsa is hard to find. But you definitely want light balsa. Where do I get my mandrel? Uh, I paid $150 to get it machined. So the, the aluminum mandrels that we use to build FAI models are sort of like uh, unicorns. They're hard to find. So we had a supply of them machined a couple of cycles ago and sold through NARCH. They sold out. Chris Flanagan got a, a batch of, I forget if it was 10 or 20, but he got a bunch of them machined. Yes, he got 10 of two different tapers. This is a five degree uh, boat tail taper, which is the right taper to use for a helicopter. He got an amazing price from his vendor. He went back just a few months ago to see if we could get another supply made. And the vendor said, uh, basically he lost his shirt on the previous batch and the new batch would be twice as much over $200. So that's hard. So getting that mandrel machined is it's an impediment frankly to success in FAI because you really need a mandrel like that to get a mandrel like that you need to know a machinist or be a machinist or pay a lot of money and uh, that's a, a real impediment so those of us who've got them um, are certainly willing to share them with locals I don't mail mine to anybody but when I'm coaching a young person for the junior team around here they're using my mandrels because they, it's it's unreasonable to expect them to do their own. It's a little easier if you're not making a fiberglass body, but you're doing a paper body the way that Steve Crystal did. You don't need a fancy aluminum mandrel with a super glass smooth first uh, surface, uh, so that the you know the epoxy and fiberglass can be can come off. Uh, you just need a crudely machined or wood cut mandrel because you're just wrapping paper around it. You're not Bought, trying to attach a fiberglass with epoxy on it. So if you're using paper bodies, which is a, a very cheap and simple approach to how you build FAI bodies, you don't need one of these exotic mandrels. You do need it, however, for fiberglass. Now let's see. Yeah, the Apogee instructions use a piece of one inch PVC. Uh, okay, well, can I say, I think one inch PVC is one inch inside diameter. I don't know that it's actually that much different in diameter on the outside than the 40 millimeter mandrel. But, um, you know, my curvature must have been optimum because I want a metal. 
There you go. Uh, no plug or plate, right? So the nose, the the foam um, disc. It's basically an ejection disc. One of the Apogee 40 millimeter foam discs is the disc that goes up in the nose that um, the hub is attached to. That is your ejection plug. So the ejection gases, there's nothing between the ejection gases and the blades down at the bottom. Uh, the ejection gases blow the nose off and the nose departs with velocity because it's a fairly snug fitting nose. And that's the velocity is sufficient to cause it to go off far enough that the blades come out of the body and unfold, but there was no plug underneath it. That was the um, the magic of the Herbie Vineyard system, that he figured out that you didn't need a tail plug, you just needed to use the nose plug, and the nose plug would pull the blades out behind it, and the blades exit quick enough that they they don't get burned up, particularly if you put a little bit of epoxy on the bottom tips of them. Uh, the blades that I have have flown several flights. They're they're pretty good. They're a little blackened at the bottom, but they have not caught fire or been damaged. It's counterintuitive. You'd think they'd get all torched by the ejection charge, but they're out of there so fast that um, it doesn't happen. You know the um, you know how the gap staging works. There's a pulse of gas that departs the engine, and then the the solid burning particles that are the rest of the ejection charge trash come behind it. It's the pulse of gas that blows the nose off. And by the time those particles are coming out, the blades have already left the party. They're already out in the air. So, so there you go. ST's ejection charges are aggressive. They're designed to clean out the inside of rockets and put recovery systems out of kits. So they are a little aggressive for a uh, for an internet's model. So they will they will tend to um, pop that nose off pretty pretty crisply. At the internets, you have to put a little extra ejection charge in the little tiny European motors when you're flying with European motors overseas. Of course, the 2023 World Championships will be flown here in the U.S. with ST's motors. But overseas, you actually have to reinforce the ejection charge to get enough bang to, to pop the nose off. Uh, is A grain the best choice? No, you never use A grain. I don't know what you use A grain for. A grain is what you'd make a cylinder out of, I think. but um, Sea grain, thin sea grain balsa wood soaked in ammonia is very flexible. It's not flexible when it's not wet with ammonia. If you use sea grain and you soak it with ammonia, you make it flexible for a short time, and then when the ammonia evaporates, it's stiff again like sea grain is. That's what you want. That's how you get away with using 132nd inch balsa for the blades if you're using sea grain. If you're using A grain, it would uh, you'd probably have to use 16th inch balsa wood to get enough strength. Do I balance my blades with clay on the tips? No. I mean, the blades all weigh the same. They're all, each blade is like a gram. Now there's, I don't know how, I don't know how I would put clay on the tips of something. I don't know how I'd put the right amount of clay out there. If, if the blades are the same weight, they're all one or 1 1.1 grams. You really don't need that. If you're building a, a big, I've used this same approach, for example, for uh, sea helicopter duration where I'm definitely not using 132nd inch balsa blades. I'm using a much bigger model, bigger blades. You know, the blades are heavier. Uh, when you start getting to large models like that, uh, yeah, you probably have to start thinking about balancing, but um, you don't have to for the internets, tiny lightweight models. This is a great, the internets design approach is really good for higher power classes of US helicopter duration because you're, you're not hanging blades out in the breeze when you're putting a C motor or D motor in the thing. You're, protecting them. The thing boosts amazingly high and the challenge is getting, just getting it back. So, and we are, yeah, so we're not using any wadding or anything in these designs. So you just uh, protect the bottom tip of the blades with a little bit of epoxy and have a really tight fitting nose cone that gets just blown off like a bullet. That's why you need the long Kevlar line to connect that to the rest of the body because it's the body, the nose hub assembly is leaving the body at pretty significant speed. And it's gone so fast that you didn't really need any kind of protection for the blades. And I used to build helicopter models for international flying that had the uh, foam plug below the blades to protect them. And that was a problem because the foam plug got blown up into the blade and um, cause the blades to snap sometimes. And 
and then Herbie Vineyard figured out you didn't really need to do that. Just make the nose fit tight and blow it off and everything works. That was, I think the single biggest innovation of his design approach was to, to do that. Let's see. Um, a little discussion about balancing the blade assembly. Um, these things are just super light. I, I don't know. I, if you've made it carefully, if the blades all weigh the same and you've used some form of alignment to make sure that they're all set at the same um, angle of attack, you really don't need to use any kind of complicated system to balance them. It'll be close enough. It'll, it'll spin right up. If you have something way off, if one blade is at a different angle of attack from the others, you're going to get a weird looking performance. But really, the, the best way to make sure that you don't have that problem is precision and construction, not balancing after the fact. Let's see, I'm running out of questions here. Dilute the ammonia. I, I don't know, I went to the grocery store and bought one of those half gallon jugs of ammonia. It's household cleaning ammonia. I mean, I'm not using 97% NH3 or something that you know would melt my hands. This is just household cleaning ammonia. Okay, I'm running a little low on questions. This is a fun event. There is nothing more rewarding than to build one of these gyrocopter models, particularly the Internet's kinds. Have it go up and eject right at Apogee and then spin up instantly and spin up so fast that it's just a blur. It is just a gorgeous model. Every, everybody stops and looks at it because it's so cool. And uh, that's the experience you want, whether it's U.S. helicopter or whether it's Internet's FAI gyrocopter. This is just a, a very cool event. and um it's a very simple event to fly it's the the building part is tricky but unlike glider um, it, you know glider you have to worry about all these little things of trimming and incidents and all the other stuff and the glides are not repeatable or anyway it's really hard to figure out how to trim the glider i do that too but, but this is much easier to fly if you built it correctly you just fold the blades up push them down in the tube stick a motor in fly there's no, no trimming. You don't have to go hand launch it or anything. You just go fly. And prepping it for a flight takes 30 seconds. So you don't have to fold a 36-inch parachute or, or do anything strange. It's just very quick. When I flew to the, um, to the metal in Bulgaria, I had a good model, but I didn't have probably the best model there. And, I, you know, I finished with a bronze, but um, not gold. But it was a matter, a combination of flying skill and, and a decent model. And you heard Steve Crystal talk about that during his talk. If you listen to his talk on Parachute and Streamer, it's about picking the right air. And I, I did a good job of picking air. And you, you, to be competitive in any international duration event, it starts with a good model and light construction, but it ends with picking air. And it's a team activity to find when you have a thermal. And that's what you want. You want to fly into a thermal. And the thermal may not be evident at the ground at the moment that you launch. So there are a variety of techniques for deciding if there is or isn't a thermal. Um, and those are documented fairly well on the NAR website. We have a whole section of the NAR website on international competition. It's under contest flying. And look for the drop down menu from contest flying. And it's international competition. If you click on that, you will open up an encyclopedia of all the tips, techniques, how to detect thermals, how to build these models, just everything. All of us who've participated in international flying have been pretty good about documenting what we do and what we've learned. And it's all there. Um, that doesn't necessarily build a model for you, but uh, there is nothing that isn't written down. And if it's written down, it's there. So we've been very attentive to making sure that this is made not easy. But it's made available to all of you who would like to go do this kind of flying. We certainly are looking forward to having more people on the U.S. international team in 2023, particularly juniors. And this is a good event for juniors. So, you know, with that Apogee kit and the Steve Crystal lightweight paper body under it, that's a competitive design. That would be a good model. And then building the hub assembly on there is not for the faint of heart. Uh, but Tim does a great job with his. He has. I don't know, 17 part video or something. It's hours where he takes you step by step how to do through how to do this. Um, 
So he's been very supportive. He, he and his daughters have been part of the U.S. international team process for years. And he's been very good about creating designs and instructions on how to build those designs that are very supportive of beginners learning how to do this. We're certainly in a much better place than, you know, when I, so I, I flew international competition in the 70s and early 80s. And then I was in the Navy and I was on ships at sea for a while. Came back to it in 2006 and everything had changed and nothing was written down. So it was the school of hard knocks of figuring out how to do this. And from that experience, those of us that shared that experience in 2006 in Baikonur, now put together an article saying, this is how you do it. And we've continued building on that to make sure that everything that we do, everything we know how to do is documented and it's on the website. So, and we're not afraid of sharing our technology and our knowledge with others because we're not winning every gold medal over there. We're not, we're not the best in the world, but we are good. And we're good because we share and, and because we teach each other. And that's what the winning teams from other countries do. They work together as a team and coach people and teach them the skills. And that's what we're trying to do. We're spread all over the country, so we have to do it more through the website. Let's see. Let's see if any other questions have come in while I was rambling along. Don't want to talk about air picking? No, not really. Uh, because it's too long a discussion. It, uh, I'd be happy to give a presentation on air picking, but it would be a that. It would be a presentation. So I won't do that here, but perhaps at the next Narcon, if we do Narcon again, we'll, we will do Narcon again. Um, I can certainly talk about it in a session at the next Narcon, whether that's virtual or in person. For FAI models, how deep do you tape the motors into the motor mount? Okay. Um, so the, the motors are, are in the bottom of the model and they're hanging out the back so that they slip into the end. So you leave about a, um, three eighths of an inch of the motor casing sticking out and you have the tape that holds the motor into the, into the tube, into the motor mount tube that occupies about half of that. So you wrap a piece of tape around the part of the motor casing and the bottom of the tube and then part of the motor casing sticks out beyond that and that fits into the top of your piston launcher so it's about three-eighths of an inch of casing that are sticking out the back some of which is then used to hold up the motor into the model with tape the rest of it's used to interface with the piston steve crystal did a nice job talking about pistons too all these models when you fly at the internet are piston launched so you, you pretty much have to do that it, it boosts the altitude noticeably and particularly in the next world championships here we will all be flying with half A. The added performance from a piston is a significant percentage of the total performance. So if you're not pistoning, you're not winning. And so if you're going into international competition, the first thing you do is you learn how to build the models and fly them and you know put a launch load on them or something and fly them off a rod. But then you move on as you advance your skills to the point that you're competitive, you need to move on into a piston system. And if you're a junior and you're not familiar with pistons, you certainly need to have a mentor who's one of us that's experienced in international flying and can show you how to make the piston system that supports your model. Doug Hilson has commented that it was actually Catherine Humphrey who figured out that you don't need a bottom plug and she told Herbie Vineyard and he um, apparently he said in the article that she figured it out. He didn't. Whatever. I learned it from Herbie, and I guess he learned it from Catherine, and Catherine was a junior when, he, when she told him. So juniors can do this really well. Okay. I think I have covered everything I know about this event, short of holding a building session um, online, which is hard to do. I appreciate all the questions that people have asked, and I look forward to flying these models with you. Gyrocopters, not helicopters. Let's go fly. Thanks, everybody.